Before we begin this morning discussing the millennium, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, oh Lord, we present ourselves to you today humbly in need of prayer, in need of you. Lord, I just said, do whatever you need to do to save me, and I know others feel the same way. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Surround us with your angels. Father, in this hour, may we fill our hearts with your word. May it never leave us. And Father, above all, may we be ready when you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Teddy Roosevelt won it in 1906. Albert Schweitzer received it in 1952. It's been awarded to the International Red Cross, oh, I don't know how many times. Other recipients have included Martin Luther King Jr., Henry Kissinger, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela. It was created from a trust left in a will back in November of 1895. It is a prize awarded to a person or an organization that does the most to promote peace in the world. Back in the latter part of the 19th century, a man made millions of dollars from the invention and manufacture of dynamite and other explosives. His name was Alfred Noble. He was the originator not only of explosives, but also of that world-famous Nobel Peace Prize. Since 1970, there have been almost 150 wars in the world, and many are still being fought. Every newly elected president comes into office with a peace proposal for the Middle East on his agenda. Mankind has long anticipated a millennium, A millennium is a thousand years, and they've anticipated this thousand years of peace. Let me ask you, will there ever be a time of peace in this world? The answer to that is no. Not so long as Satan and all his evil angels are alive. Before we look at Satan's future and the millennium, Let's look at where he came from and what he is doing today. We know from God's word that he was the highest created angel who covered God's throne. Ezekiel 28 verse 14. We're told in Revelation 12 verse 4 that he rebelled in heaven. And he talked one third of the trillions and trillions of God's angels into rebelling with him. How in the world he did that is a mystery. But they were, had a war in heaven, Revelation 12 says, and they were cast out of heaven. Today, he's causing havoc on our world, causing as many as will listen to him to sin. He hates God. He hates God's law. He will do anything to keep people away from God and his righteousness He doesn't want us in church. He doesn't want us studying the Bible. He doesn't want us listening to truth. And once you figure that out, a whole lot of things that happen to you take on a new significance. You know, Sierra over here that you also see teaching up here with me, well, we take turns. We both have said many times, before we teach... And she can tell you this is true. The week before we teach, all kinds of things happen to us. When you get up on Sabbath, you're sick. You've got a headache. You don't want to get out of bed. Who, who's causing that? This is Satan at his finest, trying to keep all of us away from God. Is Satan allowed to roam the universe today? Yes. Many people think he's only confined to this earth. No, he's not. He can't get into heaven now, but we know from the book of Job 
that Satan entered the councils of heaven as the representative prince of this world. He went to the councils of heaven. He didn't live there. That was not his home anymore because he was kicked out of heaven. When did this end? This ended at the cross. From then on, Satan was banned from heaven. But can he still roam the universe, annoying angels passing back and forth and annoying beings from other worlds passing back and forth from the other worlds? Yes, he can. Will any of the other beings, will any of God's angels listen to Satan now? No. At Jesus' death, when they watched Satan manipulate the crucifixion of Jesus, when they watched the evil angels pretend to be humans and yell, crucify him, the whole universe lost sympathy with Satan. He's an evil, lying, murdering being, and they clearly saw it. How long is God going to let Satan and his angels continue to wreak havoc on this world and irritate the universe? Satan resents the information in Revelation, which is why he keeps people from studying it, which is why nearly everybody you talk to says, oh, I don't read Revelation. It's too difficult. Have you ever heard people say that? Revelation's too difficult. I don't even look at that book. That's Satan. Revelation is an uh, unsealed book for all of us to study. It's not too difficult. And why he has caused many to misconstrue doctrines within the book of Revelation is because he keeps us from studying it. He doesn't want us to understand it. He wants us to be lost. But God has opened Revelation to our understanding. See what he has to say today. Today's study is from chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. Now the term millennium, that word, is not in the Bible. That's the word we've given it that represents a thousand year period. This thousand year period is a step, one of the steps in Satan's eradication from the universe. Now, um, it comes from the Latin word. I don't think anybody cares, but milli meaning a thousand and annus meaning uh, years. So it's millennium meaning a thousand years. There are so many false theories about revelation and Satan that we need to stay strictly with God's word. He wants us informed. The book of Revelation is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, why would he make a book that we couldn't understand and call it the revelation of Jesus Christ? He wouldn't. We should be eager to study it. Before I begin an explanation of the thousand years of Revelation 20, let's understand that there will be two resurrections. We've talked about this before. The first resurrection occurs at the beginning of the thousand years when Jesus comes, there'll be this thousand years we're going to talk about. And the second resurrection, which will be of the wicked, occurs at the end of the thousand years. All right. Everybody got that? Two resurrections. A resurrection of the righteous at the beginning of the thousand years. Resurrection of the wicked at the end of 1,000 years. So keep in mind. The resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the dead are separated by 1,000 years that we call the millennium. Before we discuss the resurrections, where is Satan during this 1,000 years between resurrections? Revelation 20 verses 1 and 2 tells us What will happen to Satan and his angels at the first resurrection? It says this, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. 
He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, Revelation is almost entirely symbolic, including this reference to Satan being bound with a chain. His being bound is symbolic of God's power over Satan to keep him and his angels trapped on this earth for 1,000 years. Revelation 20 verse 3 tells us why he's trapped here. And it says this, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Satan will have 1,000 years with nobody to tempt to think about his coming annihilation in the lake of fire. Now, the first resurrection takes place as Satan is bound to this earth. So in Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5, what did John see in vision taking place after the rescue of the saints, both living and dead saints, the righteous, that God rescued them, second coming, and took them to heaven? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall always be with the Lord. And he ends by saying, therefore, comfort one another with these words. What does Revelation 20, verses 5 and 6, call this resurrection? It says, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. The righteous dead of all ages and those who are alive will be taken to heaven at that time. Satan, his evil angels, are bound to this earth for the entire 1,000-year millennium period. But at the end of the 1,000 years, there is a second resurrection. Revelation 12, 5 speaks of it. The rest of the dead, the wicked, did not live again until the 1,000 years were finished. The wicked dead will be called forth at the end of the 1,000 years. John 5, verses 28 and 29 says, An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation, judgment. So a resurrection of the righteous and another of the wicked occur 1,000 years apart. And in each resurrection, it is Jesus Christ that calls them forth from the grave. So three things happen to the righteous who are raised from the dead when Jesus comes and who are alive when Jesus comes. First, they will be changed from mortal to immortal. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 54. Our bodies will be incorruptible. Now, this kind of flies in the face of those who believe that when you die, you have a soul that flits off into the netherlands somewhere. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing. Nothing. So our bodies at that point will be resurrected and then we will be no more aging, wrinkles, I like that part, limping or pain. Secondly, they'll be given bodies like Jesus' body, glorified and perfect. Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21. Jesus stated in Luke 24 verses 36 to 43 that he was flesh and bones, having his disciples feel his body 
And then to prove it, he ate some fish and honey after the resurrection. Do you remember that story in the upper room? So Jesus is in heaven now. He is flesh and bones, but he is in a glorified body. And our bodies will be like that when we are taken to heaven. Third, we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And then John wrote, wait a minute, before I go to that, I want to mention something else. Because we learned in a lesson that Sierra taught that Jesus Christ is going to be impersonated. Do you remember this? Do you remember that lesson? He's going to walk on this earth saying he is Jesus Christ. He's going to be glorious, brighter than the sun. He's going to speak with a melodious voice. He's going to quote scripture. He's going to heal people. And is the world going to fall at his feet and worship him as Jesus Christ? Yes. Now, what's the difference in that and what I just told you about the second coming? The righteous are going to be what when Jesus comes? Standing on the earth, walking around with him? Or what? Caught up in the air to meet Jesus. Please put that in your brain. Put that in your brain if you're watching on the internet or listening on the radio. If it is truly Jesus, every eye will see him. And we will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. Never will be there a time when there is actually Jesus walking on this earth again, healing people, so forth and so on. That will be Satan who is going to impersonate Jesus. Will Christians be fooled? Yes, they will. Because he's going to look like, act like, talk like, heal like, Jesus did. Please remember that if it is Jesus, we will be caught up in the air to meet him. And Satan is not permitted to counterfeit Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. Then John wrote in Revelation 20 verse 4, that we've been taken to heaven. I, I, Diverted a minute there to make sure we understood about the second coming. Now let's go back to the beginning of the millennium. John writes this. I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Who is them? Who's them that that John saw sitting on thrones, judgment was committed to them. They are the righteous that God took from the earth to heaven and they live and reign in heaven with Christ for a thousand years. The righteous of all ages will participate in the judgment during the 1,000 years. Whoa, doesn't that strike you as odd? Doesn't God know who will be saved? Why does he need our help judging? The cases of everybody who's lost, including the devil and his angels, will be reviewed. This judgment will make clear to each person saved that the people who weren't saved didn't choose to be saved. They didn't want to be saved what happens to the wicked living and dead at Jesus second coming where are they now there are a number of texts but let's just look at three first Isaiah eleven four: with the breath of his lips he, he shall slay the wicked now does he do that on purpose and you're dead no It's that wickedness cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. So the wicked people living on earth when Jesus comes will simply be slain 
by what he says and by the brightness. Psalm 68, 2. Let the wicked perish at the presence of God. The only reason Jesus could live and walk on this earth for the 33 and a half years he did was because he submitted his glory to being in the form of a human or nobody could have stood in his presence. The glory of Jesus' very presence will slay the wicked. Sin cannot exist in the presence of God unless God veils his glory and permits it. Revelation 25 is our third text. But the rest of the dead did not live again. Until when? Till the thousand years were finished. Revelation 20 verse 5. The living wicked are slain by the very presence of Jesus at his second coming. The wicked dead will stay dead until the end of the thousand years and the second resurrection. You know, when a single angel appeared at Jesus' tomb, the entire group of Rome, 50 Roman guards fell like dead men, Matthew 28, 2 and 4. When the brightness of all the angels appear in the heavens, along with God the Father and God the Son, sin cannot remain in their presence, in that glory. The wicked who are already dead when Jesus comes will remain in their graves till the end of the thousand years. Many believe, and this is sad, but boy, they believe it. Many believe that the unsaved are going to have an opportunity, a second chance to be saved. Is that true? Do you have this life and then you get another second chance? Some, no. What does the Bible say about this? It says in Jeremiah 25, 33, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth to the other. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. That's trash on the ground. It would be impossible for any person to repent during this thousand year period because no human will be alive according to the Bible and the righteous will be in heaven. The wicked will be either in their grave or lying dead on the earth. Revelation 22, 11 and 12 makes it clear that every person's case is closed when Jesus comes. And during the 1,000 years, the only beings on law, beings that are alive on this earth are Satan and his evil angels. It will seem to them like an endless bottomless pit because it will be dark. Because the sun and the stars of our galaxy will burn up. And this surprises some people. The same word used in Genesis 1 verse 2, without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep the same words used for deep and bottomless pit refer to the same thing earth is totally dark no light no humans only satan and the angels second peter 3:12 says this as you look forward to the day of god and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. And the elements will melt in the heat. Jeremiah also gives us a glimpse of the earth during this thousand years. I beheld the earth. And indeed it was without form and void. There's those words used in Genesis or uh, Genesis 1 and 2 and the heavens had no light I beheld the mountains and they trembled and all the hills moved back and forth I beheld and indeed there was no man and all birds were gone so this is truly a jail for Satan and his evil angels 
Revelation 20 verse 3 says that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. Okay. What are the saints doing in heaven during the 1,000 years that Satan is confined to this earth? We will be participating in the judgment. Revelation 20 verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the work of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Now let's pause a minute. I want to divert for one second. When we talk about the mark of the beast, which is not next week but the week after, when we talk about the mark of the beast and a mark in the forehead, what does that mean? Does that mean they're going to put a chip in all of our foreheads? No. If you have the mark in your forehead, it means that you buy into the false doctrines, hook, line, and sinker. They got you. Nothing will change your mind. You believe it. If you have the mark in your hand, what does that mean? That means you don't believe it for one minute. But you're going to go along with it. Because you're afraid if you don't, you'll be persecuted or you'll lose your job or you, some other reason. But you're going to go along to get along. And that is the mark of the beast in your hand. Let's go back to the millennium. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. During the millennium, God is going to open the books of heaven for the saints. Now, I've had people say to me, well, why would he open books? We got computers. I have no idea how God keeps records. I know the way he could say it to mankind in a way they could understand was to tell them in centuries past that he keeps record books, that the righteous names are written in the books of heaven, that the dead are written in the books of heaven, that our deeds, our forgiveness, and so forth are all recorded. And God is going to open these books, whatever they are, that we will be able to read them, look at the names, and decide for ourselves that God was absolutely fair and just and that everybody who is saved is safe to save. We're also going to be able to see the evidence of God's mercy and justice and impartiality. God is totally impartial in his dealings with mankind. Is he trying real hard to keep everybody out of heaven no no he's trying as hard as he can to get everybody into heaven that will listen to the holy spirit's call he's calling thousands do you know we see thousands of people walking into the church today that we've done nothing except stand here and do we have a visitor today tanya raise your hand this is Tanya today. She's been listening to our seminars on Saturday morning. For how long, Tanya? And she came today for the first time. Is that not praise God? You see, there are many Tanyas out there. They're searching. They're looking. And God is calling. The Holy Spirit is calling them into God's remnant church. And we're going to be able to see the record of the people that were called over and over and said no some other day. No, not today. And we're going to see how many thousands and thousands of times God called the hearts of those people and they said no. I praise God for Tanya and the people that say yes to the Holy Spirit. Even the angels that were lost with Satan, their lives will be open for review. 1 Corinthians 6.3 says that this judgment 
only involves the wicked dead, Revelation 20, 12, we will be able to see why some people we love, some preachers that we admired aren't saved. And we will be satisfied that God was fair and just in all his dealings. Do you know, we humans, we have a propensity for seeing somebody up front preaching and we think, oh, that person is so holy. And sometimes we fix our hearts and our minds on that person. We want to emulate that person and be like that person. And inside, they're living a whole different life. And I know I've told you this before, but one of the girls that I graduated from nursing school with, she was in my wedding. Her dad was head elder of a church. And at his funeral, she told me, she was so messed up that I went and spent a weekend with her and we spent the whole weekend on our knees in a motel room praying and crying for her. She could not get over it. Her father died. The church was packed with people for this loving elder. And he had abused his three kids, sexually abused them. She can't even remember the first time from the time they were babies. And they were sitting there holding each other's hands. She said, my knuckles were white. I wanted to stand up and scream. He's no saint, you people. And she, and she was so emotionally torn by this that when she called me, I flew to Michigan and I spent a weekend praying with her. You see, you don't look to people ever. You don't say, oh, they're holy. I'm, I want to be like them. God sees the records. And I'm sure when people in that congregation get to heaven and that man is not there, they're going to say, he was the best head elder the church ever had. Why isn't he here? And they're going to see the years, the years that he abused his children and messed up their lives. So don't ever get the idea that we follow a human. We don't. Don't ever, ever, ever follow a human. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus always. And if somebody in the church, this church, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Catholic church, you know, the priests that have been um, called on the block for what they've done. And I had a girlfriend say, I've left the Catholic church because of what the priest done. You know what I said to her? Your eyes weren't on Jesus, were they? You don't leave the church because somebody in the church is wicked. Please understand me when I tell you we're all wicked. Every one of us. And you do not walk away from God because a fellow human being is wicked. You see, the judgment that we're going to participate in in this 1,000 years, we're going to look at the books and we're going to see why the people we think should be there aren't there. And we're going to see the many times God called them and we're going to be satisfied that God knew what we didn't know and that God had used all the resources of heaven to save that person and they would not be saved. And we're going to be satisfied that God was fair. You see, God already knows right now who will be saved and lost. God doesn't need the judgment. The judgment is not for him. The judgment is for our benefit and for the angels in heaven's benefit and for the benefit of all the people who live on all the other worlds who have been watching us. We'll all be able to open the books, see how many times God called our loved ones, how many chances they had but absolutely refused his love and pardon. And we're going to see that there's absolutely no excuse for sin. Almost everybody I know that wants to discuss their sins begins by telling me why they're sinning. 
It was my mother, my brother, my sister, my uncle, my aunt. It was the circumstances. It was I was so poor. I've had to steal. It was there is no excuse for sinning. There was no excuse whatsoever for Satan to be jealous and start that war in heaven. Each person responds or doesn't respond to the Holy Spirit's call inside their mind. Is there any chance that Satan and his angels are going to be pardoned? Yes or no? No, not a chance. Why? Did God give them every chance in heaven to be, to, he would have forgiven Satan. He would have forgiven the angels. They would not be forgiven. And the Bible says he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. He said when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. John eight forty four. Satan is everything opposite God. He's evil to the core and he will be, praise God, he will be annihilated. So what event occurs at the close of the 1,000 years? Revelation 21, verses 2 and 3. John is in vision. Remember, this is the last living disciple. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, listen to this, the tabernacle of God is with men. That means God is going to change his address and move to this earth. This holy city is about 1,500 miles on each side, the Bible says. And we're even told where it's going to be located on earth. In that day... His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem. Zechariah 14, verses 1, 4, 5, and 10. I have stood on the Mount of Olives. And I know Noreen has too. Anybody else that's been to the Mount of Olives? You stand there and it is just, doesn't it, Noreen, on the Mount of Olives, you just, it gives you goosebumps. You're standing there knowing that this is where the holy city is going to land and be on this earth. It'll settle on the Mount of Olives. That's where Jesus went away, remember? And he said, I'm coming back. His first coming was for his saints. His second coming is going to be with his saints after the 1,000 years. When the holy city settles on this earth, God will resurrect the wicked dead. Revelation 20, verse 7. When the 1,000 years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Satan, true to his nature will immediately begin trying to, he'll lie to the people and he will tell the people that he has resurrected them. And the wicked from all angels, from all ages, will listen to Satan and his angels. And he will probably claim that the holy city is rightfully theirs. They just have to go up and capture the city. He'll convince them that if they unify, God does not have a chance. With the whole world against one city, the victory seems certain. We don't know how long this time will be. How long will it take Satan to rebuild factories and create weapons? We don't know. But Satan will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, Have you heard that term in the Bible? Gog and Magog means evil forces. So evil forces to gather them together to the battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. Satan represents himself 
and to his deluded subjects as a redeemer, assuring them that it's his power that has brought them forth from their graves. He's about to rescue them from the most cruel tyranny, and he proposes to lead them against the camp of the saints and to take possession of the city of God. With fiendish exultation, he points to the unnumbered millions who have been raised from the dead and declares that as their leader, he is well able to overthrow the city and regain his throne and his kingdom. Great Controversy, page 663. And don't you think all the wicked are going to be impressed with all the angels surrounding Satan? And do you think Satan is going to appear to them as an ugly being? No, He's going to make himself glorious in front of them too. And he'll make his angels shiny. And all the wicked will buy right into his scheme that they are able to capture the city and have the beautiful city for themselves. At that point, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which the Bible calls in Revelation 20, verses 9, and then chapter 21, verse 8, the second death. The wicked, we're told in Malachi 4, 3, will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, please note, Satan isn't in charge of hell, as many believe. He will be in it and cease to exist. When the wicked are burned up and the fire goes out, what glorious, thrilling event will take place next? And we're going to be able to watch it, which I think is so cool. Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, Isaiah 65, 17. Won't that be cool? We're going to be able to watch it. Can you just see him saying, let there be land? And you're going to watch it happen. Let the trees, and we're going to watch the trees. Uh, it, it's, it's exciting to even think we're going to get to see that. And Second Peter 3.13 says, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Second Peter 3.13 and Revelation 21, 5 says, Behold, I make all things new. The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. It's like God himself is going to live here and be our God. Revelation 21, 3. So wherever heaven is now, it's going to relocate to this earth and God's people will at long last receive the kingdom promised to them Isaiah 35 10 says they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away you know it's too fabulous to describe and too glorious to miss and it's too near for any of us to take any other path but the one that serves Jesus Christ. When I study the Bible, which is about all I do, uh, the Lord knows I don't clean the house or cook. Um, I sit there studying. And you know what I think to myself? You know how dumb it is to be lost? It's dumb. What is on this earth that you want more than heaven. I can't think of anything. And when I begin to study and think, there's nothing. Lord, take me to heaven. Do whatever it takes to save me. Just save me. It's so far beyond our imagination what God has planned for us. Let me ask you this. Will the wicked be able to see the righteous inside the new Jerusalem? The walls are crystal clear. What do you think? Yes. The Bible says so. Revelation 21, 11, and 18. The righteous will see 
the wicked. Psalms 37, 34, when the wicked are cut off, you will see it. Hope in the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. Psalms 37, 34. Not my words, God's words. Why do you think God would let us see the wicked destroyed? I've thought a lot about it. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us why he's going to let us see it. But you've got to admit it will bring a final absolute end to sin. Do you think God will cry? I do. Do you think we would cry if somebody we loved is lost? Yes, I do. We'll be crying. Why wouldn't you listen? Absolutely. Luke 13, 28 says, there will be weeping, gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. The heartache and the trauma will be great, but when the fire goes out, God will hit the delete key in our brain and the Bible says that's the point at which he wipe away all tears. There will be no more death, sorrow, or pain. Revelation 21, 1 to 4, Isaiah 65, 17. So, you know, have you ever been to a funeral where somebody die, has died? Well, I guess if you're at a funeral, somebody's died. But uh, the preacher is saying, and now they're in heaven, no more death, no more sorrow, no more tears. Well, if you were in heaven right now watching what the rest of your family's doing on earth... Would that be heaven? Would there be no more death, no more? Uh, no, no, that's a very false statement. When will that take place? After the fire goes out and then God takes it from our minds and God will cry too. He created Satan. Satan was his greatest angel, his masterpiece. He loves those. He loves them very much all the angels he created. And to have to execute them is going to be agony. Sin has been a terrible, crushing load on both the father and son. And if you study the scriptures and you read about Satan, he covered God's throne. Do you know he had pipes, plural, in him? You know that? So he led the choir in heaven. We have one pipe in us. Satan had pipes, plural. I've always wondered if he had do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, so he could sing in harmony with himself. How, we don't know how many pipes he had. We'll see, find out when we get to heaven. But he was a glorious angel covered in jewels. Study and look and see what he was. And he got so full of himself that he rebelled against God. Hosea 11, 8 says, God says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. Sin has been a universal ordeal. It's God's desire for everyone to be saved. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some people count slackness. He's long-suffering towards us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he can only save the forgiven. I want to talk to you for a minute about something that's on my heart. Discussed it with Pastor Alberg this morning. There are many people within our churches, not just our Seventh-day Adventist church, but in all the other churches, who feel that they are perfectly free to live in some degree of sin. They are living with someone they're not married to, for example. Or they're, they're doing something, they're stealing from the uh, kitty at work. Or they're consistent liars. 
or any of the other sins you can think of. But they fool themselves that God is going to save them. And many of these people are among us in our churches. And they feel like God is so loving, so kind, so gentle, that there's no way he would keep me out of heaven. He knows I love him. And I just have this one sin. I plead with you this morning to understand God cannot tolerate sin. And there's absolutely no excuse for sin. Sin is something that we do in absolute rebellion against what we know to be right. It doesn't matter how pleasant and enjoyable the sin is. It's sin. Naturally, Satan makes it pleasant and enjoyable. He's the master deceiver. Let me plead with you this morning as we finish up this lesson on what happens to the wicked to understand that we will only be in heaven if our minds are absolutely pure and free of sin. Is that easy to do? Yes. You simply say, here I am. You know I'm dumb. You know I'm wicked. Save me. Take it out of me. And when you're approached with a sin or you begin thinking about it, sing. I've told several people, start singing, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. And it will go from your brain. I know because I've done it hundreds of times. And I appeal to you that the only way we will stand before God is if we have confessed every sin and we've given ourselves completely to him, given our temper to him, given our impure thoughts to him, given everything to him. Will you join me in working towards that? This week, Jesus is coming so soon. Let's be ready. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we are before you, your people. We do love you, and you know that we're wicked, and we're lazy, and we're caught up in things that Satan gets us involved in. And, oh, Lord, show us, point out our sins, show us where we're wrong, and then give us the will to bow before you and say, forgive me, Lord. Be with Pastor Alberg. May the words he speaks bring us closer to you. And as we go through this Sabbath day, let's reflect and read and study on how we can be closer to you and be your righteous people ready to be caught up in the air when you come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone.